If you're not using Pathlib yet for anything related to dealing with files and folders, you're missing out. This video is a deep dive into Python's Pathlib package that's been available since Python 3.6. I'm not just going to talk about Pathlib and what you can do with it, but also about how some of the magic behind the package works and how you can apply the same magic to your own code. Before we dive in, if you want to learn more about how to design software from scratch, I have a free guide for you. You can get it at arion.codes slash design guide. It contains the seven steps I take when I design new software and hopefully helps you avoid some of the mistakes I made in the past. I've tried to keep the guide short to the point so you can get the information quickly and apply it immediately to what you're doing. So arion.codes slash design guide and the link is also in the description of this video. So you might say, why do we need a library for dealing with paths? Can't we just use strings? Well, yes, you certainly can. In fact, this was the way that most packages in Python dealt with paths before version 3.6. If you use strings to represent paths, you're going to run into a couple of very annoying issues though. First, if you want to construct paths from parts, it's a pain. If you use OS join, for example, it quickly becomes code that's really hard to read. Second, depending on the platform, there's a different way that paths are represented. POSIX versus Windows, or forward slashes versus backward slashes. If you forget to take this into account, your code only works on one of the two platforms. And third, there is some information in the path that you might want to have access to easily. The parent folder, the file extension, whether something is a file or directory, and so on. If you're using strings, you have to write the code for that yourself and hope it doesn't contain any bugs. Now, I must also admit that in past videos, I regularly didn't use Pathlib. Why not, you might ask? Well, in Dutch, there is a nice expression, voortschrijdend inzicht. In English, this roughly translates to progressive insight, but I'm not sure it covers the nuance of the Dutch version. In any case, what it means is that you learn and improve along the way, and that's what I'm doing as well. So expect more appearances of Pathlib in my videos in the future. What's nice about Pathlib is that it's an object-oriented way of dealing with paths. Paths are objects and they have useful methods and operations that you can perform on them. Let's take a look at a few examples. I have a very simple example here. There's nothing in here. It's just an empty main function and I'm importing path from Pathlib, which is what we're going to use to deal with paths. So here are a few basic things you can do with path. For example, you can get the current working directory. And that's very simple. We just have the static current working directory method that we call like so. When I run this, then this is what we get. So this is the folder where I'm storing my temporary files that are used for recording. You can also print the home directory. And that's with path.home. And this is my home directory on this machine. What these methods do is that they actually return a path object with either the home folder or the current working directory folder. You can also create your own path objects. And you can do that simply by passing the path directly to the string. Let's say uh, user bin Python 3, for example. So now we've created a path object. Now, this doesn't check whether the path exists or not. If I just add some uh, random crap here and then I run this code, then uh, there is actually no problem whatsoever. There's no check. You can actually check that by printing whether the path exists, like so. And now, of course, this path doesn't exist, but if I remove this crap at the end and then I run the code again, then the path actually exists. So the forward slash that's on uh, Unix, Linux based systems like what I'm using here, Mac OS. If you're using Windows, then you might want to use backslashes. Let's say you have something like this. Now the problem is that these backslashes don't work because in strings they have special meaning. But what you can actually do in Python, that's actually really cool, is you can put an R in front of the string, and then it's going to treat this as a raw string, so you can directly write backslash characters in that. But let's go back to the Linux version. So let's say I have a path slash user. What you can also do with paths is using the forward slash operator to create new paths. So instead of writing user bin Python 3 in a single string, I can actually also do this. 
and that creates the same path. So also that path exists, of course. But this is a really useful operator because it means you can in a very natural way construct a path from strings. Or you could start with the current working directory, like so, and then you can create a subfolder like this. Now in my current working directory, there is a settings.yaml file that contains some random things. So what I can do is I can create a path for this particular file using this method, like so. And now of course, this path exists because that file actually exists. But now reading the file is actually really easy using a context manager. So path.open returns a file. And then we can simply print the context of the file, like so. And now we get this. There's actually a shorter version of this. You can also simply print path.readText. And then you can read the contents of the file using a single line of code. If you don't define a full path, you can also resolve a path to get the full path. Let's say I have a path that's just settings.yaml, like so. So if I print this path, let me just re remove these lines to make that a bit clearer. I'm simply going to get the name of the file. But what I can do is print path.resolve. And resolve returns a new path object with the resolved path. That makes the path absolute. So when I print this, I'm going to get the full path of that particular file. Paths also have properties that are really useful. For example, we can print the parent of a path. Let me use f strings for this. So it has a parent object. But when I run this, you see that there is actually no parent or the parent is actually relative. If we want to have the parent of the absolute path, we first need to convert this local path into a fully resolved path. So let's create a full path. That's path.resolve. I'll delete these two lines. And then if you do full path.parent, you're going to get the parent folder, which is the recording folder. And parent itself, you can see that here also returns a path. So you can get the grandparent. Is that what we call paths? Is that correct? Well, here now we get the grandparent path. And of course you can continue doing this until you reach the root. You can also print the name. So that's the name property. And what that prints is simply the name of the file or the folder, the local folder. You can also print the stem. That's using the stem property. And that's the settings name of the file. And then there's also, of course, the suffix, which prints the file extension. Another thing you can do is check properties of the path. For example, you can check whether the path is a file or a folder. So this checks whether the path is a folder, or maybe I should call this directory. Folder is not how we developers call this, right? So it's not directory, of course, because this is a YAML file. So if we do is file, then we're going to get through as a result because this is a file. There's also a really easy way to create new files using path. So let's say I have a new file, which is the current working directory, and we're going to create new file.txt, like so. If I want to create the file, we can simply call the touch method, like so. so when I run this, you see that on the left, there's going to appear a new file.txt. Of course, there's nothing in there. But now that we have the new file, we can also call write text. Let me delete this. And now when I run this code again, it's going to create the new file.txt and it's going to write hello to it. Deleting a file is also really easy. We can simply use onlink for this. So now it's created and immediately deleted the file again. You can also create a new directory. And that's also very simple using the make dir method. And now we have a new directory. 
One of the nice things of Path is that lots of Python packages support it directly. For example, if you want to change to a directory, I can simply pass it a path object and that will work right out of the box. So I can change to this new directory that I just created and then I'm going to print current working directory. Like so. And now when I run this code, then we see that the current working directory is the new directory that we just created. And finally, deleting a directory is also really simple. We can simply call rm dir, remove the directory. And then this is what we get. No new directory anymore. It's quite common to set paths in configuration files. Think of specifying the folder where your sample data is stored, where to output log files, and so on. You can use simple data classes to deal with config settings. If you want to learn more about data classes, by the way, check out this video where I show you everything you need to know. Now, unfortunately, data classes don't have built-in support for processing and dealing with paths. If you're using a package like Pydantic though, path processing is supported right out of the box. Here's an example to show you the difference between using data classes and using Pydantic. So I have a class Pydantic settings here that has a path and an other, which is a string, doesn't really matter what this is. And this is a subclass of Pydantic base model. But I have an alternative here called settings and settings also has a path and other. And then in my main function, I'm creating a path similar to what I did before. And then I'm going to parse the YAML data that I loaded from the path. Now, when I create a settings object using Pydantic settings, and this is how you would do it, then I can access that path as an actual path object. That's what you see here. So path is a POSIX path because this is Mac OS and I can access its parent like so. But with data classes, this doesn't work. So if I turn this into a comment and I'm simply using data classes, then I'm going to get an error because it's actually a string. And you can actually see that when I print the settings object, you see path is simply a string. Data classes don't directly support converting paths. Even though in the settings class, I specify that path is a path object, it's still stored as a string. If you're using Pydantic, this works out of the box. As you've seen, one of the nice things about Pathflip is that there's a really cool way to construct paths using the slash operator, which relies on some Python magic. Not all magic is good, <coughs> pandas query, <coughs> but this is pretty cool. How does it work? It relies on a programming feature called operator overloading. The slash is actually the division operator and Python allows you to define what the behavior of an operator is when you use it with an object of a particular type. Many other programming languages have the same feature as well, by the way. I remember implementing operator overloading in C++ when I was working on a game engine used for research in the beginning of the 2000s. Anyway, let's take a quick look at how you can do operator overloading in Python. I have a very simple class here, class point, that gets an X and a Y value. These are floating points. Nothing special here. Uh, I have a main function where I create a point and I print the point. By the way, as you can see, I'm passing integer values to the point initializer, but X and Y are both floats. Strictly speaking, this shouldn't be possible because an int is something else than float. But Python treats float types as a special case. Actually, in PEP 484 is written when an argument is annotated as having a type float, an argument of type int is also acceptable. And this special treatment is basically a shortcut. Arguments that are either an int or a float are really quite common. So in this way, you don't have to write float or int, but you can simply write float and also accepts integer values. So how would operator overloading be useful here? Well, for example, I might want to do something like this and divide the point by two. And then if we want to be really mathematically correct, probably we shouldn't call this a point, but we should actually call this a vector because points are not something that you would generally divide by two, but vectors are. So let's turn this into a vector. So this is what we want to do, but currently, of course, this is not supported because the slash operator doesn't, is not supported for a type vector. But what you can do is actually define a Donder method so you can define what the slash operator is actually supposed to do. And in order to add support for the slash operator, we're going to implement TrueDiff. 
And what does that get? Self add. It gets one other value, which is a floating point. And this is going to return a new vector. So this will return a vector of self.x divided by other and self.y divided by other. And now we can print point divided by two. Actually, when you run this code, I didn't even run this, then this is what you get. See, we get a vector with x is 0 0.5 and y is one. And this is how we created it initially. So this is really cool. You can actually implement all the arithmetic methods so that vector multiplication and division and addition, etc., is all possible. For example, we could also define the add donder method. And that's going to get another vector. And this will return a new vector. Like so. And now we can write print point plus point. And of course, this should be other.x and other.y, like so. And now when I run this, we get the sum of these two vectors. And because of the way that we define these operations, so true div returns a new vector, we can actually combine these things. So I can now add point to point divided by two. And then this is what we're going to get. So operator overloading is a really cool feature. And in some cases, especially for these kinds of data representations, overloading the operators can really help in making the classes more usable. I hope you enjoyed this deeper dive into Python's pathlib package. If you did, you might also like this video where I talk more in detail about string formatting, which is also a really cool feature in Python. Give this video a like, consider subscribing to my channel if you want to learn more about software design and development. Thanks for watching, take care, and see you next week.